let's begin with inflation. So inflation simply is when you have an increase in the average prices of goods and services in an entire economy over time. Although, as we'll see, it's not as straightforward to estimate whether that's happening or not. Suppose, for example, that Canada has an annual inflation rate of 3% this year. So if that's the case, it doesn't mean that all prices have increased. It could be that some prices have decreased, in fact, but overall, on average, prices have increased by this percent. Okay, so some prices might be rising, others might be, you know, might remain constant, and others might actually be falling. But if there's an increase in inflation, it means overall there was an average rise in prices. In exceptional cases, such as in the Great Depression, um, prices may re remain constant, in which case the inflation rate is zero, or there may be defl deflation, which is a general decline in prices. For the most part, we see prices uh, are typically increasing. We will usually see the rate of inflation be very low, or it, we could even have deflation. Uh, we usually see that, though, in recessions, okay? Now, there are some terms that we should sort out here. So, inflation is when the average prices of goods and services in an entire economy are increasing over time. So, if you look below here, uh, if this, okay, so if inflate, so inflation means that the price index, like for the percentage change in the price index is positive, okay? So, that means prices have increased. If that is increasing over time so if the percentage change in the price index is increasing over time we call that inflation we're saying that prices are going up over time disinflation you know we still have prices are higher in one period than the one before but the rate at which they're higher is falling and that's called disinflation the so prices are rising but at a decreasing rate over time and then deflation is if they're actually negative okay so deflation is when prices are actually falling. So in order to calculate inflation, we need something that captures the average price level in the economy. And the most popular measure to do that with is called the consumer price index. So it's the most common measure of inflation. So the price index itself is an inflation. It, the percentage change in the consumer price index is what captures inflation. And we'll learn that, uh, how to calculate that later on. So um, the CPI, depending on which country, uh, will, I mean, all, of, all countries usually base it on a representative shopping basket. Uh, in Canada, it's roughly 560 consumer goods and services. Each country has a, a slightly different basket, uh, but generally the idea is the same. Uh, usually these baskets are for the typical urban consumer, um, but this isn't the only thing they look at. They also have different measures uh, of inflation. Some will look at producer prices and things like that. So there's different indexes that you can use to calculate uh, changes in prices, but the most common headline figure uses the consumer price index. And so basically it's tracking price changes of a shopping basket that's representative of the typical consumer. And we'll learn a little bit more about the details here about current and base year in a moment. So here is a classification structure of the consumer price index. So the all items CPI has all of the different components. So basically what the statistical agencies do is they have sort of elementary indices. So they calculate price indices for different uh, components. So the, there's eight major components, food, shelter, household operations, furnishing and equipment, clothing, footwear, transportation, health, etc. And within each of those, there are even smaller uh, index. So it could be, there could be one for cereal under food, okay? Or under shelter, there could be one for rental apartments or something like that. And the all item CPI is a weighted average of all of those, okay? So there are 566 of those elementary aggregates, and those are coming from the eight major categories here. So let's look at a simple consumer price index. So suppose that we have an economy and the only two goods are hamburgers and milkshakes. Now suppose in 2014 we've obtained some data and we got the prices of each of these two goods and we got the quantity consumed. Okay, now using this information, we can calculate the cost of this basket of good or the amount of expenditures on this basket of goods. Right? We have the prices and we have the associated quantities. So all we do is just multiply the prices by the quantities and take the sum. And so in this case, the 
cost of this basket of goods is $50. Now, suppose we have data from 2015 and we have some new prices. So the prices of hamburgers have increased by 20 cents and milkshakes have increased by uh, 5 cents. Now, what we typically do when we calculate the consumer price index is we need to hold the quantities constant in a particular year. In this example, we're going to hold the quantities constant in 2014. And so what we're doing in 2015 is we're calculating the cost of that basket of goods again, but we're holding the quantities constant. Okay, and so if we do that, we get that the cost of the basket is $53.50. If we use the 2015 quantities, then we're going to have prices and quantities changing over the years. But we're interested in just how prices change. Okay, so here the value of the basket rises from $50 to $53.50 over this year. So now, how do we get an index, a price index, out of this information? Let's first look at just a simple index, not even a price index, but a simple index. And then we can use this idea to see how we calculate the consumer price index. And then we can actually see what the differences are. So suppose we have some annual sales figures below, and there's a new CEO that started in 2019. So we have three years of data here. These are sales figures. These could be in the millions, okay? And then we know in 2019, there was a new CEO. So let's dedicate 2019 as the base year, and let's create an index. So it's very simple to do. All we do is take in each year the sales figure and divide it by what the sales figure is in the base year. Okay, so we're going to take 540 divided by 680. The base year is always just going to be equal to 1. Okay, and then in the third year here, the 2020, we're going to take 980 and divide it by 680. And then these are the figures that we'll get. But to make it an index, we just multiply it by 100. It's not a percent, though. We're just multiplying it by 100. And what do we get as a result? Well, we get a nice, simple, clean series of numbers. And we can look at this and immediately see that after the CEO uh, came aboard in 2019, the sales increased 44%. So we can just read this right away. That's 44%. And then we can take this difference and see how much lower they were before. So when you create an index, the, the purpose of creating an index is basically just to create a nice clean series of numbers. Okay, and we'll see with the price index too. It's not only that it's a nice clean series of numbers, we can use it to calculate inflation. And also we can use it to convert a nominal series of data into a real series of data. So we can actually remove the price effects from a nominal series of data. So we'll talk about that later on. So also, to, you know, so just to note, the, this transformation that we've done here uh, keeps the percentage differences between these uh, figures the same. So if I did the percentage change between 980, you know, new minus old over old, remember our percentage change formula, I'm going to get 44%. So, and if I do that with these two numbers, I'm obviously going to get the same thing. Same with these numbers. If I take this as my new and that as my old and calculate the percentage difference, I will get uh, exactly the same thing if I do it with this series of numbers or with this series of numbers. Okay, so now in terms of a price index, the only main difference here is that we're going to be doing the same procedure, but we're going to be using the cost of a basket of goods. Here we're using sales figures, and they they were you know they just came out. We didn't have to calculate these; they're just the yearly sales figures. But when we're doing a price index, these numbers here will be the cost of a basket of goods, and that, and how we calculate the cost of that basket of goods uh, will you know result in differences in what price index we get. But the procedure is the same. We have our cost of baskets of goods for each year, and then we're just going to create an index doing the same thing as we just did here. So in our example here with the hamburgers and milkshakes, we have $50 in 2014 and 53.5 in 2015. So to get an index, it, so first thing we need to determine what our base share would be. So we're going to use 2014 as the base share, and this is the base share of which we held the quantities constant. So to calculate an index, we're just going to do 50 divided by 50, so that's our base share equals 100, and then we're going to take 53.5 divided by 50, multiply that by 100, and that'll give us the second number in our index. Okay, so if we do that, we will end up with a price index that looks like that. So when you see consumer price indices 
I mean, if you look up on Statistics Canada or if you see them around, they'll be in this type of format, right? They'll be, uh, they could be less than 100. You know, they could be like 58.2 and they go up to 100 and then they go, you know, 101.1 or 103. They'll, they'll be in this type of format. And so that's how you get them. They're based off of the costs of baskets of goods, and they're all calculated relative to a particular base year. So clearly here we can see immediately that the prices have increased 7% between 2014 and 2015. Is everyone with me? Does anyone have any questions? Now I must say what they do at the statistical agencies is a much, much more complicated and what we're learning here, there's all kinds of issues with this because um, one of the issues is, if, you know, you want to hold the quantities constant because you want to have just a measure of how prices change. But that, if you're thinking of the price indice as measuring the cost of living, well, then you have to account for the fact that people can adjust their consumption behavior uh, based on price increases. So you kind of do want the quantities to change at some extent. There's also issues with the, you know, how do you, if you held the basket constant in Canada since the 1950s, how are you going to incorporate new products like cell phones and that sort of thing? So there's a lot of complicated issues with this. And there's also lots of issues with actually getting estimates of, of the data you need for this. So, and actually there, you know, there's ways of rearranging the formula that we're going to see for this so that you can use expenditures and it, it, it can be quite complex, but we're just getting the main idea here of what a consumer price index is. Okay, so we know what a percentage change is, right? I hope you remember. So the formula is simply just the new value minus the old value over the old value. So we're usually it depends on the context. So if I told you that a can of Coke is $3 at the corner store and $2 at the grocery store, if I ask you how much more expensive it is in the convenience store, then the new number would be the three, and then what if that's relative to would be the grocery store, which is two. And so you would do three minus two over two, right? And then divide that by, um, you would multiply the, sorry, you would multiply that by 100. But if I ask you how much lower is the price of the grocery store compared to the price of the convenience store, the new number is going to be two, and then you're going to subtract three, and then you're going to divide by three, and you're going to get a different percent depending on which way you're looking at it. In the context of inflation, it's very simple. We're always just going, the new number is always just going to be the, you know, a, a year in the future compared to a, and then the old number will be some year in the past. So we're typically going to, the new value would be, in terms of uh, chronolo chronological order, would be the, the most recent number would be the new number, and then the old value would be some some index figure before that. And so we're just looking at the percentage change in the price index value to calculate inflation. And I mean, we saw that already on the previous slide. So here, to calculate inflation, we take 107 minus 100, and then we divide that by 100. That's going to give us 7%, okay? So that's that is, would be our measure of inflation. So inflation is the percentage change in the price index. So if you see a graph of the CPI, that's not a graph of inflation. That's a graph of the price index. Inflation is the percentage change in the price index. So for example, here, uh, just for in terms of calculating a percentage change, if at KFC you had the two the two dollar to me Tuesday special, if it had a price increase to two dollars and thirty nine cents, what would be the percentage change? Well the new number would be two thirty nine. Can't really call it much a Toonie Tuesday special anymore, but we'll go with the example. Uh, so the difference here would be thirty nine cents and the uh, denominator will be two dollars. So if we calculate that, uh, that results in a price increase of nineteen point five percent. So the percentage change is really just the difference in the value. So how much it's changed as a proportion of what it was before, okay? And so anyways, this is the formula we use to calculate inflation. Inflation is just the percentage change in the price index, okay? So we would just take the CPI in the current year minus the previous year and divide it by the previous year and then multiply that by 100. So in the example we looked at before where we have 107 and 100, the inflation rate here is just 7%. Okay, so here's a, a question. I'll let you think about this for a moment. Um, you might want to just, you, you could, let me just check if I have an 
Well, let's just you you can just uh, type the you can type these into an Excel spreadsheet very quickly, and then uh, see if you can calculate the cost of the student basket of goods at each of the years. So here we're going to calculate a student price indice. Uh, so we're going to assume that there's only three products that these students consume: photocopies, pizza, and coffee. We have the prices uh, in each year. Now the quantity is only in 2015. We don't have the quantity for the other two years. So we're, but anyways, we're going to dedicate 2015 as the base year. Okay. So what I want you to do is just calculate the expenditures each month and then create the index. Okay. So I'll just give you a minute or two. So as soon as anyone gets an answer for what this is, just type it in the chat function and then well, so actually what we'll do is we'll just do the expenditures, just type that in the chat function, and then we'll move on to how to calculate the index values, okay? So if you can type that in the chat, that would be great. I'll give you a minute. Okay, good job. So here are different GDP deflator values, okay? We're just obtaining them by taking nominal and dividing it by real and then multiplying it by 100. And so we can calculate inflation using the GDP deflator, same way as we did before, just calculating the percentage change. And we get 14.6% uh, between 2015 and 2014, and 12.2% between 2016 and 2015. So nominal incomes can be adjusted to take price changes into account. Um, so can the value of the economy's entire output. So actually any nominal series, you can convert to a real series by using the, um, you know, by using a, a price index. In this case, we could use the GDP deflator. Uh, we would do the same thing as we did before. We would take the GDP deflator. Uh, so we have the, sorry, the, we could calculate real GDP using the deflator just by taking nominal GDP and dividing it by the GDP uh, def deflator, okay? Um, so that's kind of obvious given the formula. So let's suppose we were given some data on different years. So we have 1997, 2002, 2010. In each year we have the nominal GDP. We also have the GDP deflator, okay? If we had this and then we had the nominal GDP, well, we can obtain real GDP just by taking uh, nominal GDP and dividing it by the GDP deflator, okay? And so that's how we would get the real GDP. So this is similar to what we were doing with the price index. If we had nominal GDP and we had a price index here, right, the CPI, we could do the same thing. We would just be dividing by the um, and you want to move this decimal place over. You take this and divide it by 0 0.92. I'm not sure why it's it just, you, you'll see that if you do the calculation, but I'm not sure why it's not telling you that. Um, but you know, you want to take the whatever index values you're using and dividing them by 100. Okay, so not too much else to say here. I mean, this is just using rearranging the formula, but you can also think of this as what we talked about before. If you have some kind of an index, price index, whether it's the CPI or GDP deflator, you can convert a nominal series to a real series using that index. Jason Dean BBA. Yeah, we've already talked about this stuff before, so I won't uh, annoy you with it. Um, so here we have the inflation rate in Canada from 1930 up to maybe around 2015. So if we look at it, we can see some sort of clear patterns. Uh, one thing is you could, you know, the Great Depression is very clearly marked here. That's uh, right here. We had prices actually fall quite substantially in that period. Now, one thing you might want to notice, too, is the, how volatile inflation is. We've had inflation as high as, you know, getting up close to 15% in, in certain years here, especially in the early 70s. Um, I remember mortgage rates at this point. Well, I don't My parents told me about it. Uh, you know, they were very high, sometimes up to 30%, which is quite, quite expensive. Um, but then you notice in the 19, early 1990s, you see that it's, Inflation is very tame now, and that's because the central bank began targeting inflation and keeping it low, predictable, and stable, which it believes is something that encourages long-run growth. So that's, you know, so basically the main pattern here is after the 1990s, inflation has been under control. Before that, it was not so much under control, although it um, was nowhere near as bad as what some countries have experienced uh, Hyperinflation has occurred in many countries where 
you could get uh, prices increasing. You know, it, you could have a rate of inflation of a million percent a year. It's, it's happened a few times. Uh, it's happened in Zimbabwe, Argentina, Germany after the war. So there, there are many cases. We're lucky. We have a relatively uh, prudent government that um, you know, makes sure they uh, don't let prices get out of control. So if you could think of unemployment and inflation as two economic evils. We don't like to have either of them. Inflation is bad for a number of reasons. One particular issue is that it redistributes purchasing power among different groups in ways that that can be you know, harmful or unjust. Um, for example, lenders and borrowers. Suppose you uh, you know, got a loan for a fixed interest rate for the next five years at two percent. Well, if inflation all of we all, if all of a sudden we had very high inflation, you know, maybe we'll think of something really high like a hundred percent. Well, basically you you're gonna pay back that lender just you know basically nothing, right? Because over that period your incomes are going to go. Your income is going to go up a lot more. So whatever the value of that loan is, it's going to be much smaller. It's going to be much easier for you to pay back the lender. So basically, the lender will lose out. And so, if you have unexpected inflation, if inflation's unpredictable, not too many people are going to want to give loans out. If they do, they're going to want to charge a very high interest rate. And you actually pay tax. Uh, if you're a lender, you're going to pay tax on the nominal interest rate. The government doesn't calculate the real rate for you. So, you know, this could lead to a lot of uh, a large decrease in economic activity. It's clearly not going to be good for the economy. And again, as I said, the Bank of Canada has been targeting inflation between 1% and 3%. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about why they wouldn't just target 0% but later on in the course. Um, inflation uh, not only means increasing prices, but also expanding nominal incomes as well. So if prices are increasing, people are going to want to have, you know, demand higher incomes. Um, so, you know, obviously the effect on someone's purchasing power is going to be uh, is going to depend on whether, you know, inflation is greater or less than the increase in nominal income. Um, so inflation redistributes purchasing power in arbitrary ways because of various types of index, index indexation. So um, if, if something is indexed to inflation, it means that it is continuously increased, usually increased, unless there's deflation, um, according to the, the inflation. So many pension plans, but unfortunately not all, would be indexed to inflation. Um, one example of something not indexed to inflation is the Sunshine List. So in, in Ontario, uh, for some reason back in the mid-1990s, the Conservative government at the time decided it would be a good idea to publish all public servants' salaries. And they're going to publish any all salaries over $100,000 per year. Well, in the mid-1990s, $100,000 was quite a large salary. If you were to adjust that for inflation, I think it would be maybe something like $150,000 per year now. But they didn't index that to inflation. So you're you know, getting to a point where a very, almost, you know, more than half of government employees, I don't know the exact number, but a substantial amount of government employees are having their um, salaries being published. Uh, but $100,000 isn't as much as it used to be, right? So in, in a few decades, you'll, um, you'll probably have that almost everyone who is a government employee will have their salary published. And so you know, that's something maybe it should have been indexed to inflation. Um, but we of particular importance are uh, senior citizens who have pensions that are not indexed to inflation. Uh, this happened to my grandfather. He uh, retired probably in the early 60s, maybe. And at that point, he had a really good pension. I think it might have been like three or four hundred dollars a month, which sounds very little now, but back then it was a lot. But it wasn't indexed to inflation. And as we saw in the graph earlier, uh, the rate of inflation was quite high in the 60s and 70s. And he ended up living till he was over 90. And so by the time he was in his 90s, that pension wasn't worth much of all anymore. So, you know, you, you can see that. Um, inflation can have these unjust or unfair redistribution of income. And so, uh, you know, full indexation would have been great for him. So then the amount that he receives in his pension, so his nominal income in that case, would have increased along with the inflation rate. Uh, you know, sometimes there could be a partial indexation where it's, it does increase, but there's maybe a bit of a time lag. 
And if you say someone has a fixed income, it means their income is not changing. Their nominal income stays constant. There's no indexation. And so people on fixed incomes are, are going to be hurt very badly if there's significant inflation. So as I mentioned before, it can redistribute power between borrowers and lenders. So borrower, borrowers will win if actual inflation is greater than anticipated inflation because you'll end up, uh, you know, the borrower is going to win because they're going to negotiate a very low interest rate. And that's not going to change. Uh, but the lender would have liked to have negotiated a higher rate if they would have known that inflation would have uh, increased that by a lot. And then the other way around, lenders will win if actual inflation is less than anticipated inflation because if anticipated inflation is very high, and the lender will demand a higher interest rate and the borrower will agree to it because the borrower also thinks inflation that's a you know reasonable thing but then all of a sudden if it unexpectedly falls then in that case the borrower would would lose out and the lender would win all of this just causes a lot of uncertainty especially in business and it's not good for the economy now there's another um way we can look at uh so we can look at the change, the percentage change in the real value, uh, and that's going to be a function of the percentage change in the nominal value and the percentage change in prices. So we could take this, so if you remember this formula from before, the real value is obtained just by taking the nominal value and dividing it by the price index. Of course, the price index would be in hundreds. Um, but we could rewrite this. Um, uh, my calculus isn't as fresh as it used to be, but if you run both sides of this and then totally, I think if you totally differentiate it, you can easily show that you could rewrite this thing uh, as follows. The percentage change in the real value will equal the percentage change in the nominal value minus the percentage change in the price. The percentage change in the price is obviously inflation. So if you know how much the nominal figure is changing in terms of a percent, and you know inflation, then you can figure out what the real, the percentage change in the real value will be. So if you have a 10% increase in your nominal income, but prices increase 20%, well, then your real income is going to fall by 10%. Okay, so I'll let you work on this question just for a minute. Okay, so here we have, uh, I don't know how to pronounce that, Etruria's nominal GDP rose from 42 billion in 2013 to 45 billion in 2014. During the same period, its inflation rate was 5%. So what percentage did nominal in, uh, GDP increase? Well, we just do the percentage change between 45 and 42, and we get 7.14%. How much did real GDP increase then? Well, we know prices increased by 5%, and so Real GDP must have increased by the difference between 7.14 and 5%. So we're just going to plug that into our formula, uh, and we're going to get 7.4 minus 5 is 2.14%. You know, we can also do that for the interest rate. You know, if we're given the nominal interest rate and then the inflation rate, the real interest rate would just be the difference. Okay, so for example, if you had uh, a certain uh, company borrowing $2,000 at 7% per annum, and if the inflation rate was 3% in the year of the loan, then the real interest rate on the loan would be 4%. So the lender would be getting a real return of 4%. Unfortunately, though, they have to pay tax on the 7%. because The government will charge taxes on your, your nominal return. But really, the, you know, if you take into the account of inflation, the lender here would have only made 4%. I'll leave this for, for homework. I want to make sure we can get through the next lecture. So you can do this. This is pretty straightforward. And so now we're going to move on to unemployment. So that's the other economic evil. So um, one of them, you know, obviously a major goal of an economy is full employment. We don't want to be, uh, you know, not utilizing our labor resources and other resources. So the unemployment rate is obviously a very important economic statistic, statistics. It's obviously reported in the media, and it's picked up by a lot of different Canadians. Um, so how is it measured? So Statistics Canada is responsible for calculating this, and they use what's called the Labor Force Survey. The Labor Force Survey tracks a randomly selected sample of Canadian households. And this, from the survey, we can figure out what the working age population is. So the working age population is basically people who are over the legal age, you know, they're legally allowed to work based on their age. 
there are some other smaller exclusions like members of the armed forces people who are in jail and stuff like that so basically it's the working age population is basically those who are legally able to work okay now that's the working age population and then the labor force is the work is the subset of the working age population who have a job or who are actively seeking employment so the labor force does not include people who are not willing or able to work so people who are retired are not willing or able to work uh student full-time students are supposed to be not uh working or else your grades will suffer um people who win the lottery you know they're these people aren't going to be in the labor force people who are disabled are not going to be in the labor force okay so the survey also uh, measures the participation rate. The participation rate is the labor force as a percentage of the working age population. And so the official unemployment rate then is essentially the proportion of the labor market that are unemployed. And But again, the people in the labor force are actively seeking for work. So if you decide to just live in your parents' basement and not look for work and just play video games, you're not included in the labor force. Um, I'm just going to open up another slide from my other course. With, oh, no, I have it here. Sorry. So actually, I'll go back. So these are the formulas for the participation rate and the unemployment rate, but I'll show them again on the next slide. So this is a good way of going about or seeing how Statistics Canada goes about calculating the unemployment rate. So we start with the total population. This example is for 2013. So in Canada in 2013, we had 35.16 million people. Now we first want to remove people who aren't legally able to work okay and uh, you know just some uh you know categories here i'm not exactly sure why they take some of these out but the big you know the the lion's share of this is people under the age of you know they're they're below the legal age to work okay so when we remove them we have the working age population okay now that's 28.67 million in canada in 2013. now this isn't the labor force what we're looking for is the labor force we want to remove from this group people who are not willing or able to work and so these include people who are retired who are independently wealthy students uh discouraged workers anyone not willing or able to work okay when we do that we get the labor force and so in canada we ended up with 19.08 million people in the labor force this is important like this these people here are what generate the country's gdp right that's where the income comes from okay so that leads to one of the measures we're going to look at and that's called the participation rate but first before we do that we can break the labor force up into two groups those who are employed and those who are unemployed and so the unemployment rate is simply just the proportion of the labor force so the proportion of this rectangle um, that are unemployed. So we take the number of people unemployed and divide it by the labor force and then multiply it by 100. And that's the unemployment rate. So in this example, it's 7.1% for, for Canada-wide. This is going to vary a lot uh, across different provinces. Now, the other measure is the participation rate. The participation rate is the proportion of the working age population that are in the labor force. And of course, the larger this is, the better, because the group on the top is what generates income. Uh, the difference, these people here aren't generating, aren't contributing anything to gross domestic product, right? And so in Canada, in 2013, the participation rate was 66.5% now this number i mean it's important to realize that you know that we'd like this number to be as high as it can be if this number is falling it doesn't mean that people are lazy or anything i remember donald trump insinuating that in one of his speeches uh, it usually can reflect demographic shifts so one of the issues we have or and not only our country but other western countries is that uh, you know, we have that baby boomer generation and they're all becoming, you know, they're all leaving the labor force now and retiring. And so the participation rate is, as a result, going to fall. And so, uh, you know, that means the tax base is going to be lower. Uh, so it can pose, you know, it'll pose some challenges going forward in the future. So anyways, that's how you calculate the unemployment rate and the participation rate. Here's a graph of the unemployment rate in Canada from 1970 up until about 2015. 
So we can see that it went up very high in some of the years here in the early 90s and early 80s. And luckily in the financial crisis, it didn't go up that much. Again, I, I believe the central bank and not only the central bank, but the uh, you know the Department of Finance as well, who controls government spending, they're getting a little bit better at um, dealing with uh, recessions, and they're you know they're more inclined now to make sure that they lower the interest rate and do whatever they can to stimulate the economy in a recession. And we've definitely seen that recently with COVID nineteen. But um, well, unfortunately, we have a, a massive deficit, but the government does pick up for that slack in uh, economic activity which means that the unemployment rate is going to jump up as much. Um, participation rates have changed a lot over the years. Uh, in, the 19, in 1975, the participation rate uh, for women was, you know, this is maybe, yeah, so it was actually under 50%. And for males, it was around 80%. And we can see that over the last few decades, uh, the participation rates of men and women are getting closer to converging. Um, if we look at only those who are between 15 and 64, this gives you the participation rates. Um, so not too much here to really point out. You can see this is for different countries for the same group. And we can see you know, some countries uh, have higher or lower uh, participation rates. So some of the countries with the highest are Sweden, Switzerland, and Iceland. If you look at it, so the unemployment rate among youths is typically m much higher than it is for people who are older, which kind of makes sense. When you're younger, you're switching jobs, you're still in school, you're you know you're you're you got lots of time ahead of you, you're moving around, but you haven't really uh, settled down to establish career yet. Uh, so also you know on a, youth have the highest unemployment rates, but they also have the lowest duration of unemployment. When someone who's in their mid 40s gets laid off from a job, they typically are on unemployment much longer than someone who is younger. And here again, you see uh, differences across countries. Uh, some of the best, some of the countries with uh, this is the employment rates, right? So it's not the unemployment rate. So the higher this, the better, right? And so you can see some countries are higher than others. Um, Canada's up towards the top here. Uh, you know, we're close to Austria and New Zealand and the United States. So if you want, uh, well, I just want to make sure we finish on time, but if you want, you can go to Statistics Canada. Actually, well, we have time to do that. We'll just go and we can actually see what the latest uh, unemployment rate is. So you can find that by going just to Statistics Canada. Here's our key indicator. So we actually have our consumer price index here. Uh, it went up 0.5%. That's a 12-month change. And so the latest unemployment rate is 8.9%. And of course, it's very that's quite high, and that's obviously because of the, the COVID-19. Uh, just uh, just going to see if they have a chart. So here's a chart of the unemployment. Oh, this is employment. So we can see how many jobs are lost, and then now it's slowly starting to come back up. Um, it'd be nice to see the unemployment rate. Anyways, you have all, all, all the data here. So there's a lot of information in, in these tables, and this all comes from the Labor Force Survey. Okay, so let's see if you can do a question. So I'll give you a minute to do this. Uh, here we're told that the unemployment rate is 7.5%. We're given the total population. We're given the labor force. And then we're asked what the number of employed workers is in this economy. So let's see if you can figure that out. Okay, good job. The correct answer is C. Okay, so all we're do we know that the labor force consists of those who are employed and those who are unemployed. So we can calculate how many are unemployed by multiplying 0.75 times the labor force, and we'll get the number of people unemployed. But we, and we also know the labor force, so we just take the difference and we can get the number of people employed. Okay, so I'll give you a sec to do this one. This one relates to the labor force participation rate. Um, actually, I'll open up a poll for this to see how many people are participating. Okay, I'll give you three more seconds. Three, two, one. Okay, so the correct answer is A. So we know that the 
Or can, we know that the labor force participation rate is the labor force divided by the working age population. And we know that the working population includes the labor force and those who are not willing, able, and able to work. So our working age population here is 190 plus 40 million. So that's going to be our denominator. And then on top, we just have the labor force. Okay, so we're going to take 190 divided by 230 and we'll get 82.6%. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll let you do this uh, for homework. Now, of course, the official unemployment rate misses a lot of things. So it's likely going to overstate those actively seeking work due to dishonest survey results. Um, it does not include the underemployed, so it doesn't, doesn't distinguish between part-time and full-time or people who have a bunch of skills, but they're not being able to put them to work. It also excludes discouraged workers who are unemployed and given up looking for work. So the reported unemployment rate understates that, well, I, the true rate, depends on how you define it. If they're discouraged workers, well, then you can't say someone, yeah, I guess you could say someone's unemployed, but they're not looking for work, right? So it depends on how you want to look at that. But certainly it's, you know, understating the potential issues. Um, there are differences between the U.S. and Canadian unemployment rate. Uh, there are important differences in the way it's calculated in each country. In Canada, for example, a job seeker who consults just one job at a month would be classified as actively seeking employment. And so they would be part of the labor force. In the U.S., this person would not be deemed actively seeking work and therefore not part of the labor force. Okay, so in that case... The U.S. has a bit stricter of a policy when it's, um, you know, considering whether someone should be in the labor force or not. So thus, the U.S. method would result in a lower rate. So if we look here, uh, this is if we this is an example. So if we have unemployed and actively seeking work, if uh, in Canada it's two hundred fifty thousand, and so we can think here, there's twenty thousand people then that would be included in. Canada's labor force, but not in the U.S. labor force. Okay, so if we subtract 20,000 from the numerator, uh, of course, because those people aren't going to be considered unemployed, they're also not part of the labor force, so we're subtracting the same amount from the denominator. So if we do that, you can see that the unemployment rate will then be lower. Just if I not include you know just by having a stricter definition of what constitutes someone uh being in the labor force you know how much they're looking or actively seeking work uh you can get a lower unemployment rate so the u.s unemployment rate tends to be a bit lower than canada and this is one of the, the reasons there's different types of unemployment so there's different categories or reasons why someone would be unemployed frictional unemployment is the result of someone switching jobs basically so if you think of at any point in time there's going to be some people that are unemployed because they're they quit their job and they're looking for a new one okay so they're temporarily between jobs or looking for a first job there are even some people who just graduated from school looking for their first job structural unemployment is due to a mismatch between jobs and people so if someone's structurally unemployed it's because their skills maybe have become obsolete and they lost their job cyclical unemployment is the, the one we typically think about when we think about employment and that's due to the business cycle or fluctuations in, in the overall economy and economic activity so cyclical unemployment is high in recessions in a booming period, if the economy is at its potential GDP, then there shouldn't be any cyclical unemployment. But there's still going to be frictional and structural. So you can't have a zero unemployment rate. Seasonal unemployment uh, is also an issue, you know, obviously in certain areas. If you live in a tourist area or something like that, there could be more unemployment in certain times of the year. So let's categorize each of these people into structural, cyclical, uh, or um, frictional. So we have Sanjit, who's a pulp mill worker, and it said uh, he's been laid off because the mill's inventories are at an all-time high. So what's the best categorization for him? I'll open up a poll here. Um, so I'll put structural, frictional, and cyclical. And we'll I'll put seasonal too. I'll put them in stru structural, frictional, and cyclical. Okay, so what do you think Sanjit is? What category does he fall in? Okay, good job. Almost all of you got it right. Um, 
So here, when we're reading this, there's no, there's nothing, there's no talk about him quitting his job. So there's nothing really here about frictional. There's nothing mentioned here about that would lead us to believe it's seasonal. Uh, there's nothing here about um, structural because there's nothing. You, we would have to mention something about his skills being obsolete or something like that. And we know that typically in a recession, firms are not able to sell stuff as much, so their inventories would accumulate. Okay, so uh, the correct answer here is uh, cyclical. Um, we'll just do uh, one more, and then we'll move on. So for B, let me open up your poll again here. So structural, cyclical, frictional, or seasonal. Okay. Okay, go ahead. So Anna, who works at a winery, is typically not employed in January and February. Okay, three more seconds. Three, two, one. Okay, good job. I don't need to explain that. Most of you got it right. Okay, so you can do the other two for homework. Um, I'll let you do this for homework as well. Now, let's talk about the concept of full employment. So full employment is when cyclical unemployment is zero. So, I mean, obviously the question is, can unemployment rate be equal to zero? Well, no, because of structural and frictional. You can't completely eliminate those. Okay, so full employment is the highest reasonable expectation of employment for economy as a whole. And so if the only thing that can really change is cyclical, and so when that's zero, we typically think that that is the full employment unemployment rate. Now, I mean, over time, structural and frictional can change, but they're not going to go to zero. Things like the internet and being able to do online job searches has certainly sped up the, the search process. But um, if you think of increases in employment insurance, that would possibly slow it down. So things like that can change. That could result in frictional unemployment being higher or lower. And then, of course, there's various structural changes in the economy. There's new technologies being invented. Uh, some technologies aren't useful anymore. So structural unemployment can be higher in some years than others. It might have been much higher maybe in the uh, 70s and 80s when we started using computers more and so a lot of uh, robotics were invented and things like that. But uh, you can't get these two to zero. So one way to get a rough estimate not that rough, but a good reasonable estimate of what the uh, full employment unemployment rate would be it would be to look at uh, the economy when it's booming, but there's not really much upward pressure on prices. So um, the estimate here is a little low. I, so before this COVID, our unemployment rate was getting to be very low, something like 5.5%, I believe, Canada-wide. And so, you know... Uh, a rough estimate would be somewhere between 5 and 6%, I think, would be the more recent estimate. That estimate that's provided there, 6 and 7%, was before the financial crisis, where you had the economy booming, uh, but there, you know, there wasn't significant inflation. And so, you know, at that point, we had unemployment at like 6 or 7%. Um, this is, again, the unemployment rate. Um, not too much to say here, but, of course, uh, one of the key things to point out or interesting things to point out is in the 40s, you know, the lowest we've ever seen in terms of the unemployment rate was uh, back in the 1940s and 50s. The highest we saw was the Great Depression. And since the 1950s, um, you know, you could see the overall the rate has gradually risen. Potentially, it could be due to things like better unemployment insurance. Um, so anyways, uh, so again, like, the natural unemployment rate is basically the full employment unemployment rate. They're the same thing. So that seems to have increased uh, to some extent. It could partially be due to uh, better social assistance and, and, and employment insurance because then people could search for jobs longer. Uh, that could be one of the reasons. There could be more. So in recent decades, Canada's estimated natural unemployment rate rose because of several trends. So the textbook is claiming that some of it is due to structural change because of shrinking manufacturing and expanding services and extensions of unemployment insurance. And then, of course, uh, higher minimum wages in some provinces may contribute uh, a little bit to that as well.
as I mentioned earlier, the unemployment rate varies a lot across provinces. So you can see Newfoundland and Labrador has the highest unemployment rate, uh, and this is 2018. Uh, Ontario is one of the lower ones, and then you have a lot of some early, a lot of the it's the eastern provinces that tend to have a higher unemployment rate. Alberta is going to be a bit higher, uh, especially lately because of oil, the oil price collapse, whereas um, maybe before the financial crisis. Uh, the unemployment there, there was probably one of the lowest. Um, there are some differences by age, group, and sex in terms of the unemployment rate. Uh, as I mentioned before, the unemployment rate tends to be higher for younger people. Uh, younger people are switching jobs a lot. You know, they're not an established career. But the, uh, the duration of unemployment is much shorter for them than for older people. But older people tend to have uh, much lower unemployment rates. And it varies across between men and women. Uh, there seems to be where the larger differences is among uh, youth. So women tend to have a lower unemployment rate when they're young than men. Of course, unemployment is costly. Where you know we think about GDP, to we have to have people working in order to make stuff. If people aren't working, they're not making stuff, and that translates into lower income. So it's a you know an inefficiency. Uh, it's also, you know, there's not, you know, there's just tons of um, soci socio demographic issues, or, or you know, it, it, if we're just set setting aside economics, there's very large psychic costs of unemployment. Uh, it, you know, things like lower self esteem, stress, all of these things are associated with unemployment, and you know, of course, you have the economic costs as well. Um, one way to measure the uh, cost in terms of the unemployment rate is to use Oaken's law. And this is just uh, basically, it's, you're looking at the difference between actual real output and potential output. So we can get an estimate of what the potential GDP is. I won't go into the details. But if you compare that to what the actual uh, output is, and the actual output is lower than potential, um, you know, that difference is basically the amount of lost output or production or GDP, which we know is equal to income. And so Oaken's law, uh, so first of all, the, the GDP gap is just the potential GDP minus the actual GDP. And Oaken's law just says that for every percentage point that the unemployment rate exceeds the natural unemployment rate, this gap uh, in real, uh, this gap between potential and actual GDP is 2.5%. Okay, so if the unemployment rate is, uh, so, and again, the only way it can exceed the natural unemployment rate is for cyclical unemployment to be positive. So if the cyclical unemployment rate is 2%, then we multiply that uh, by 2.5%. Yeah, so that would, we would get 4.5% as being the GDP gap. So this difference, so, uh, so the actual GDP would be 4.5% below potential. And basically, we take 2.5, multiply it by the cyclical unemployment rate, and then we multiply that by the uh, actual GDP. So suppose real GDP is 2.25 trillion, the unemployment rate is 8%, and the natural rate is 6%. What is cyclical employment? Well, here it's 2.1%. That's just the difference between these two figures. And according to Oaken's law, what would be the GDP gap? Well, we would just take 2.5, multiply it by this, but in hundreds, 0 0.021, and then multiply it by real GDP, and we get uh, 100, uh, $118 uh, billion. That concludes the, the lecture for today.